part than that. Here, we actually have numbers. We can say this sequence has complexity 9, right? This sequence has complexity 14. And sure enough, as this number goes up, it gets much harder to predict the sequences. And what he did is he um, took a whole bunch of these, gave them to a lot of students, and gave them IQ tests. And sure enough, um, the IQ test and their ability to deal with complexity correlated. As, as you, it's not that surprising, really. Um, so this is actually a computable, but only in the sequence prediction sort of domain, right? And finally, Ben Goetzel is um, about to publish a paper where he takes this universal intelligence stuff and then tries to approximate it in different ways and do various things. Um, it's not published yet. I, you sent it to me. I'm one of the guys who provided comments and so on for his paper, so I can't share that yet. But there, there is, he's doing some work on that as well. So there are some things happening here, but it's still quite immature. Okay. <clears throat> now. Do I think that all this universal theoretical stuff is going to drive AI in the future? I think it's good. I think it's a big improvement. Um, but I suspect that some of the key things are actually going to come from neuroscience. And if you look at um, the Monte Carlo AIC, Really, if you want to make that work well, a lot of it comes down to building better compressors. So it's, good, it's better at predicting what's going to be a better model of what's happening in the future. And so while you, you have now decomposed the problem into Monte Carlo tree search and having very good compressors, you know, you still haven't, that's a beginning, but there's still a lot of the problem to be solved. How do you deal with all sorts of complex sequences and stuff? You need to build very, very powerful compressors to do these things. So it hasn't, hasn't, it hasn't fully solved the problem. In order to solve the problem from there, there's an enormous amount of research to be done with compressors and, and actually really doing all the modeling what's going on in the world and all this. So I suspect that where, it's, where we're going to get a lot of things from, a lot of mileage from, is theoretical neuroscience. And this is the reason why I haven't actually been working on uh, complexity type things recently. And I've come to London um, to work at the Gatsby unit at University College London. <clears throat> and the Gatsby unit is an interesting place because they do theoretical and computational neuroscience and machine learning. So they're actually working at the interface of two different areas. One is all the theoretical machine learning stuff from artificial intelligence, and the other side is the computational theoretical neuroscience. And they're finding the points at which these things are crossing over. And I think that's really interesting, and I think there's a lot, of, a lot of interesting things happening there. And so I'm arguing that the brain is not a black box. Usually I don't have such a gory picture of a brain, but it's Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so you've got the cerebellum here, you've got oh, so cerebellum down here, you've got the cerebral cortex, a bit of uh, brain stem. Right, so, <coughs> when we look at a brain, and you start looking at some theory of neuroscience, you actually start to see a basic architecture for an artificial intelligence. <coughs> it's really neat. So I'm going to try to explain in the minutes that remain a little bit of this. So this is the um, cerebral cortex. So this is this is this part up here. Not not the stuff under here. Well, there's a whole bunch of stuff underneath this. So there's actually a whole bunch of. So this is sort of the outside view of the brain your brainstem coming up here, and there's a whole bunch of stuff underneath this subcortical, and that's important too. But we'll start off with this here. This is a very interesting system. One of the first interesting things about it is that it's basically a sheet, and it's got all these folds in it because it's been crumpled up to fit inside your skull. It's actually about the size of a dinner napkin, right? And it's such a useful thing that the brain seems to have had to evolutionary scrunch it all up to fit inside your skull because it's, it's of such value it wants to get more and more of it in there right? and this sheet acts as sort of like a computer to the brain and it has a, a, a fairly consistent structure it's got depending how you count six to twelve layers um, and it's pretty similar across the whole the, the whole from 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 the back to the front of the brain up and down it's pretty similar you find similar kinds of neurons and similar layers right across the whole thing. Okay. Now, <clears throat> the way it's split up 
is you have, basically, this is the back of your brain, this is the front of your brain. The back side here, is, 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 there's something called the central sulcus down the middle here, which is a kind of a, a valley. Now, this whole blue side, the back side here, is the perception side. So basically what that does is you have information coming in from the world and it processes that information. So here we've got areas 17, that's the uh, primary visual cortex. So you've got from your eyes, you go, you go down to optic nerve, you go to something called LGN, then it gets projected up to here. And here, you've basically just got a map of what you're seeing. Okay? So this is where the visual information comes in. Uh, 41 here is the primary auditory, so your sound is coming in here. And then along here, you've got touch that's, and uh, proprioception, so it's like angles of your joints. And stuff like that. So this is all your touch stuff, this is uh, uh, sound, this is vision. And then what happens is that at each of the, say in vision, it's a little bit more complicated. You've actually got multiple pathways and sort of stuff going on, but basically, what happens is that you get different areas going up and it goes from very, very simple, like a map of what you're seeing to finding more and more abstract features of, <clears throat> of the world. And so it builds a hierarchy of abstraction from the most basic features like edges, orientations, moving edges, areas of light and dark and so on. And it builds up more and more abstract features until you get up to this lighter area here, this is association cortex, where it represents things like Bill Clinton. Right? And you can find neurons up here which will respond seemingly just to Bill Clinton. You can have a picture with a whole bunch of people and the neuron fires when there's Bill Clinton there. Bill Clinton can be a cartoon, not a real picture, he can be young, he can be old, all sorts of different things. And so up here you have representations which are very, very abstract. Here, it's not so abstract. Same thing goes on in sound, same thing goes on motor. On this side here, it's the lowest level sort of touch stuff. As you move away from it, it's much more abstract things to do with what you're perceiving about from touch. Right? Now, if we go over the other side, we've got the same basic idea going on, but now it's an executive system, it's the action system. So along here, we have all your, all your ability to drive muscles. So this is all the uh, muscle driving to move your fingers and speak and do all these sorts of things. And then as we, as we move away from this, it becomes more and more abstract. So it, it, it starts having um, plans of action and then whole sequences of action all the way up to sort of you know, long-term conceptual thinking about things, right? And so you've got this beautiful architecture. You've got this hierarchy um, from low-level perception all the way up to more abstract sort of perception. And then on the other side, you've got the executive side, the action side of things, from very low level things up to very, very abstract things. Do the, does the central fissure, yeah. got the representation of the body? Yes, yes. Do they match up? Yes, they do. So you have actually a sort of a linear map of your body. I can't remember exactly. You've got your, your hands are down here or up here, or your face and your tongue and everything. And then on the other side, it matches up. And what happens is if you actually look at the connectivity, You've got, this, you've got this, oh, this mirror image, they actually connect at about the same level. And then it, it, this holds up the hierarchy as well. So you've got an area up here, uh, Broca's area, which is um, to do with the generation of sentences and meaning in sentences. And then you've got a Vertica's area, which is the corresponding part over here, which is the recognition of the meaning of sentences. So you've got the generation side and you've got the recognition side. And if you damage one of these, you can lose the specific ability. So if you damage this area, you can lose the ability to recognize the meaning of sentences, but you can still construct meaningful sentences because you've got the generation side and vice versa. And not surprisingly, these two areas connect up with each other. This area doesn't connect down to this area. It wouldn't make sense. So what we have is we can basically take this and we can remap it out into some hierarchy. So we have all your senses here, you have the information coming in here, it becomes more and more abstract as you go up, and also the, the senses become integrated. So you have things up here which represent um, things to do with touch and sound. And then on the other side, you've got the same thing, but you've got the executive side of things, right? And that's what drives your actions and so on. And so you've got muscle firings down here to do things, all the way up to long-term conceptual planning. 
And what you find